cream behind you. So it's John 12, 20 through 36. We may all read together. Now there, now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to the worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while everyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. And all the people said, Amen. Welcome to church today. Just want you to know that it, it's been one of those weeks for this pastor in the sense that as I have been struggling, I want you to know, struggling with how to talk to you about the mountain. God has been good. And he has shown me a few things that I didn't know before. One of which is all of what you just read, all of what Jesus just said and that you repeated was said after Passover. Jesus is eating the Last Supper with his disciples and everything that happens afterwards, so everything that you just read in John chapter 12 happens after he has eaten, at least as far as how John puts his gospel together. It strikes me that the very fact that we are talking about this temptation of Jesus, this specific piece of what happened to him way before in the desert with the devil, now comes to its pinnacle, now comes to its, its absolute point of emphasis. As I was with the kids, uh, they, they were uh, being taught about Passover today by their teachers. And it strikes me again that the, the Passover is about the Lamb. 
And so that's why I'm excited about next week because we will have Passover and communion and Easter. I mean, yes, I know that Easter is a, a date that gets picked by the church in, in the early part of Constantine's reign and, and it is on a solar calendar whereas Passover is on a lunar calendar and so they don't often happen as they did the, the time when Jesus celebrates Passover with his disciples. He celebrates this meal and then he becomes the very Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world that his cousin John had pointed out at the very beginning of his ministry just before he was tempted. So like a, an opus, like a beautiful piece of music that has a beginning and then has a, has a conclusion at the end that matches the beginning, this is what we get to talk about today. So you can imagine that that my mind is just going crazy because there's all of this analogy, there's all of these, these metaphors about Jesus and the, the, the plan that, that he embodies. And so it's, it's difficult in some respects to, to just break it down for you. So please uh, pray for me uh, as I do this because I'm excited. I'm excited about the fact that, that we're talking about this before this weekend this coming up weekend. And, and again, I want to, to emphasize the opportunity. We don't call it a duty. It's not a duty that you have to come to church. Okay? It's an opportunity. And the opportunity next week will be to celebrate this communion in the midst of Passover and to get answers to the questions that I posed to you earlier. Which cup did Jesus drink? Which piece of bread did he take and break and say, this is my body, you'll be able to get a chance to forever afterwards, whenever you celebrate communion, and we hope to celebrate many communions with you in the years to come, that ever afterwards, you will never be able to celebrate communion the same, because you will always be thinking, this was the meal that Jesus was having. He was having Passover, and that he is not only the bread of life, not only is he his blood, the sacrifice that we're looking for, but it is because it is the blood of the lamb, which, as we said to the kids this morning, harks right back to that blood of the lamb that was put on the doorposts and the lintel of the buildings of the people of promise, the people of Israel. And that when the death angel saw the blood on the doorposts, he passed over. Yes. So yes, we celebrate as Christians, we celebrate Easter uh, because it's the day that Jesus resurrected. And what I want to tell you is that the exciting part about that is that if there had not been a resurrection, then Passover would have been for nothing. If Jesus had not come out of the grave and, 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 and risen on the third day just as he prophesied, there would have been no reason for any of the, the whole sanctuary service. Any, everything would have been for nothing. But we have an opportunity to go back to the beginning with Jesus today and we have that opportunity in the context, in the context of preparing now for Passover and for Easter. You see, the devil came to tempt Jesus at his lowest human point. Let us not forget that Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He is, he is emaciated. Those of you who understand fasting, or as I was speaking with individuals last night, those who don't understand what they're doing and maybe go on to some sort of crazy diet and they do things to their body which hurts their body. But those of us who, who maybe want to lose weight and or think of the fact that the Bible actually encourages us to fast occasionally, you have the realization that your body changes 
in a major way when you don't eat, when all that you're doing is drinking very little. Jesus could hardly move. He was not using his godly power. He was 100% human, 100% God, but he was not using his godly power on his own behalf. So don't think that Jesus had any advantage. He was no super person when he's out in the desert where he has been sent by the Holy Spirit straight after being baptized and having his father speak to him and having the Holy Spirit come down upon him in the form of a dove. He goes out into the desert and he doesn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. And at this very low physical moment when his defenses should be down, when his mental acuity should be at its lowest because his, his glucose is low, he's, he's not going on all cylinders. This is when the devil comes to him. This is when the devil decides is going to be the time when he will tempt him on all points. The Bible says, and Ellen agrees, he is tempted on all points as humans have been tempted and as we, the current humans on earth, will be tempted on a daily basis. So if you feel at all that this week you have been tempted in any of the categories that I'm going to list for you now, then understand that the program of the prince of the air in this world today has not changed from the very beginning when he first tempted our first parents, Adam and Eve. Same temptations, maybe packaged differently, are going to be what he uses on you and me every day of our lives until Jesus comes and every bit of this kingdom will be wiped away and we will be changed and we will be living in a new in a new era, in a new place, in what we are calling heaven, with our heavenly Father. We are going to be tempted every day until that day. So Jesus goes into the desert, and the first thing he is tempted with, because now he hasn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights, he is tempted to make stones into bread. So you have bread, the next temptation actually is mountain, which we're dealing with today, but my wife and I decided to swap it out for temple two weeks ago. If you were here two weeks ago, we talked about the temple, and then today we're talking about the mountain. So you have the three temptations of Jesus, and you have three areas in which these temptations uh, refer to. The first one is bread. Bread is physical. Bread is to do with the economy of humanity. If you control the bread, you control the world. Yeah. Jesus is offered an opportunity, as you remember, he's offered an opportunity to just go ahead and short circuit. That's a, a word that I'm wanting you to now associate with these temptations because the fact is that that is usually what the devil is trying to do. He's trying to give you this easy way to achieve what he believes you think that you should be doing. Shall I just throw something out there? Oh, I'll just go to church. Then God will think I'm all good. Ever thought that thought? Ever thought that it might be the devil trying to tell you to do it? If it's easy, if it's without suffering, if it's not with complete eradication of the way in which the world does business, then it's probably something that the devil has taken a little bit of good, actually a lot of good, mixed a little bit of doubt with it, and then fed it to you. Because that's exactly what he does to Jesus. He says, Jesus, if you are the Son of God, he can't help himself. Believe me, my friends, if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, you will also hear the temptations of the devil. And guess what? He can do no other than his character. 
He can't help himself. He will try to insinuate doubt in your relationship with God. And this is what he does with Jesus. He says, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Now, Jesus, Jesus does this wonderful miracle later on in his ministry. What does he do? He feeds, the Bible says, 5,000 men. We think there are women and children there too. So let's just say 15,000 for round numbers. One other woman, one other child. He feeds thousands of people with five loaves and two fish. He does the miracle that, that the Messiah was said to be able to do when the Messiah would come. He would be able to make bread because he was to be the bread of of life. Jesus says he is the bread of life. Here the devil is giving him an opportunity to short circuit his mission. And he would have to do so by disbelieving his heavenly father whom he has just heard. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The devil's first temptation at the very lowest physical point of Jesus' life is, do you really believe that that is your father? Do you really believe that he sent you on this mission? Do you really believe that he would do this to you, let you become so emaciated at the point of death? Do you really think that he would let this happen? Just go ahead and use some of your you know, godly power on your own behalf. Make these stones into bread. You don't have to believe him. Doesn't that sound a lot like what he said to Eve? Do you really think that you're going to die? God said you would die. Do you really think he's telling the truth? So this week, as you review, maybe quickly, you, 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 you play, the, play the tape of, of, of this week in your mind, there's probably going to be times when you will realize, you know what? He tempted me not to believe in God. He tempted me not to trust God. He tempted me to do my own thing, to believe that I needed to take care of my own needs. The devil is not going to leave him alone with that. He takes him to the temple. <clears throat> he takes him to the temple. And on the pinnacle of the temple, he says, throw yourself down because, of course, the angels will catch you. He wanted him to be at the temple because, you see, he was offering Jesus the opportunity to have the religious leaders of the day accept him without any uh, equivocation without any uh, dispute that sure enough, look, he jumped off the temple and he didn't die. Spectacle. Spectacular. Of course we're going to accept him because he is the one who has come like a lightning bolt from heaven. Again, short circuit the mission. But all you have to do is bow down. Worship me. The problem with accepting this particular challenge for Jesus was, number one, the religious cultists, proper word, the religious grouping of that day was not doing what God had intended it to do. Here we sit, we're... Uh, you could say we're obedient, church-going people, and we've come to church today, and here the pastor tells you, oh my goodness, <clears throat> do you think your church-going is precisely what God is wanting from you today? That's why I'm telling you, there's no law that says you're going to hell if you don't come to church. In fact, I've asked hundreds of people that question, and every single one of them has answered in the same way. I ask them, are you going to hell if you don't come to church? And the answer is always no. 
But then I get to ask my next question. So why did you come to church? Okay, that's when I catch people who just lied to me. Okay, they really did come to church because they thought if they don't come to church, they're going to hell. But they told me no. Or I catch people who say, no, I want to come to church because I, I want to be with the believers. I want, to, I want to be encouraged by the believers. This is the answers that I'm looking for, by the way. And I want to be an encouragement to other people. This is why Paul says that we should gather ourselves together is to be an encouragement to one another, to hear beautiful music, to sing beautiful music like we have already done, to praise God, to pray to God. We have that opportunity as a congregation. We have congregated ourselves together for that purpose. And I prayed just a moment ago. I asked God, please come and join with, inhabit our praise, be a part, accept the worship that we bring today. That's, that's part of the reasons that we come to church. But does coming to church save us? Is it what God requires in order to check, they get eternal life? And the answer is no. No. What saves us is our relationship with Jesus Christ, with God directly. And that's why the devil attacks that. He attacks your relationship with God by saying, do you really believe him? Do you really trust him? Just go ahead and throw yourself down. The Bible says he'll catch you. He wants us to presume upon our relationship with God and he wants us to, to have that relationship of doubt, thinking that, I can do whatever I want, and God is going to have to come through with his side of the bargain, right? Doesn't work like that. So the next thing is that the devil takes Jesus up onto this high mountain. And that's where we are today in our story, in our progression of these three temptations where we're talking about the upside-down kingdom that Jesus brings when he brings his gospel because as you remember or maybe you don't but I'll just remind you Jesus keeps saying to people you have heard that it was said but I say unto you do you remember ever reading something like that Jesus came and the religion of the day the 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 religious people of the day were messing it up Ever wonder whether or not we might be? I'm, I, I'll tell you, this, this pastor right here wants to be very, very sure that I'm not messing it up. And I would suggest to you, if you call yourself a Christian, that it should be part of your thought process on a regular basis to be saying to yourself, I'm claiming to be a Christian. I'm claiming to represent the Almighty God. Is my life representative of that relationship? See? We have a new football team in town. Are you getting those things on your feed like I am? It's not the L.A. Rams anymore, is it? Who is it now? Those Chargers? I guess we got the L.A. Chargers now. You know what they're saying? We are going to earn your respect. They're not even expecting you to know that they exist. They're not even expecting you to, to think very highly of them. They are going to go out to the gridiron, they say, and they are going to earn your respect. They have come to L.A. to make it their home. They know it's your home already, and they are going to be your team, and they're going to earn your respect. How'd you like that? L.A. Chargers. Not San Diego anymore, L.A. And we want you to respect us. So we're going to earn your respect. We're going to wear the team jersey. Ever thought about the fact that when you accepted Jesus into your life, when you said yes to having the Holy Spirit lead and guide you and be your coach, 
that when you go out on the gridiron of life, you are wearing the team colors. I actually had that happen to me. <laughs> One of those guilty moments, you know. I'm in a video store long years ago when they still had tape. And I realized that I had this Christian t-shirt on. And I, 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 I tell you, I was just shot through with like, oh my goodness. What if? You know, people see what I'm wanting to rent. And then they say, really? Really? That? And you're wearing this Christian t-shirt? It's kind of like those people with the bumper sticker. You know, the fish on the back? And the finger out the window? When they, you know, when you cut them off or something? Did they forget about the fish on the back? I, I, I don't know. But that's, that's the feeling that I want you to connect with, okay? Jesus, Jesus is offered the opportunity when he, when, when he gets up to the top of this mountain, he's offered the opportunity to be the king of the world. You, you can have all of this if you just bow down and worship me. If you just give in to me being the king and me having the power to grant you all of this. I think this was the most audacious temptation. Because we can see today very definitely how the politicians and also the superstars of our world have had to do this and how they have basically said, yes, I will bow down. I will pay the, I will pay the piper. I will pay the price. But I also want to be great in this world. Here's, here's how it doesn't match with what Jesus came to do. Jesus kept saying to his disciples, I don't know if it's ringing in your ears like it is mine right now, my kingdom is not of this world. You're trying to tempt me with the kingdoms of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. What is that little saying that we like to say uh, uh, when we're working with our children or when we're working with other people, we're saying, we're supposed to be in the world, but... Whoa, 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 you ready to say that today? In the world, but not of the world, not like the world. Do you see why I struggled this week? Because I cannot help but have this particular idea of the mountain and being offered this political power be reflexive in my own life as I search my soul and say, how am I living that shows that I am in the world but not of the world? That I do business differently. Started thinking about various pieces of my life and I don't know, have we just become lazy? I speak about myself. You can, you, you can respond to the Holy Spirit however you want to respond. But as you do life, just review in your mind, this, just this last week, as you do life, are you doing life in a way that reflects the fact that your king is the king of the universe and that you came to church on a Sabbath, the seventh day, to commemorate the Creator God. But yet all week, you've been living like everybody else. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I want you to know I'm feeling a, a certain level of conviction on the fact that if I claim that yes, I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world, I'm not connected to this world, then that means, if I claim that, that I need to live life differently. I need to live life by different metrics. 
take care of my mom. Let's get down to basics. Take care of my son, my daughter, my family. Do we do it like everyone else does it? Or do we do it differently because we're doing it according to the metrics of the kingdom of heaven, which we say we're a part of? Not just on Sabbath, not just by coming to church and, 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 and encouraging each other by, by sitting in our pew, but, but every day of, of every week doing what we can in our sphere of influence to, to turn the, 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 the tide of, of the economy of this world back. I mean, it's, it's hard. But this week, I was talking to one of my neighbors, and we're talking about my involvement with Family Promise. And Family Promise needs to find, would love to find, a piece of land on which we would build like several houses or a motel unit or something like that so that these families that Family Promise helps might be able to stay there instead of going doing the circuit around with the various churches. For those of you who are visiting with us today, Family Promise is a national organization which our church is involved with, and every six weeks or so, we have two to three families that come and stay in our classrooms, in our Sabbath school classrooms. They use those classrooms as bedrooms, and our fireside room becomes their, their dining room, and our kitchen is their kitchen, and they live here on campus for a week. And we feed and house them. Then they move to a different church. And right now, Family Promise is trying to find more churches to be involved with this. We certainly are glad that we have more church groups that are going to form work groups that, for example, we might provide the place and they will send the workers. Currently, we like to back off to four times a year. And so we would ask them to provide workers for us two times a year, and we would have workers four times a year. Because it does take quite a bit to prepare for two to three families to stay with you. It's like having them come to stay at your house. You need bedding, you need uh, 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 toilets, and, and, and they, they go and shower else, elsewhere because they leave us in the mornings at 7 o'clock. And why are we doing this? Because, my friends, these are individuals who are in our community whose kids are going to our schools, who, as I, I, I euphemistically say, have fallen off the bed. For whatever reason, they have come to the place where they are homeless, living in their cars, no ability to do laundry. If, if you've never been homeless, <laughs> believe me, when we do a sock drive out here, when we do an underwear drive out here, if you've been homeless, you'd understand that you don't have the ability, you may not have the money to do laundry, and so you might wear a pair of underwear for a whole week and then want to throw it away when you're done because you can't wash it. You don't have the ability to wash your socks or your underwear or your clothes. How do the teachers know who the homeless kids are? And there are estimates that there are 500 to 700 kids in our community who are couch surfing or living in someone's garage or living in their car. Yes, Santa Clarita, our community. Should we, should we have the attitude of not in my backyard? No, that doesn't exist. I'm just going to la, 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 la. Or should we say no? We operate by the principles of the kingdom of heaven. Our house should be and can be available to those who need a place, those who need a roof over their heads. This congregation, my friends, has said yes to that. I praise God that we have said yes to that. But that's just... That's just one small piece for a maximum at this point of 14 individuals that can be in the Family Promise program at any one time. There's a waiting list. 
as long as your arm, of people who could benefit from this program, yet there's not space. This is the world in which we live, my friends. Jesus was offered the opportunity to be the king of that world. The world that, that where, where some people are in and a lot of people are out. And we just don't care about the ones who are out. We're sorry for you that you fell off the bed, that you don't have a house, that you don't have money for gas to take your kids to school or the doctor. We're sorry for you. We don't care for you. We say no. This congregation says no. We will care. We will get involved with an organization that vets these people, that checks them out, and that puts them in the program, and that the program is designed to help them get a job. It's designed to help them get back into housing and to keep their kids in school. Now, my friends, you can look at many different non-governmental organizations around the world, and that is what they're trying to do, mostly in what we call the 1040 window, for millions and millions of people. So it's really hard to understand that it's happening right here in Santa Clarita. It's really hard. It's much easier to see pictures of, of people in Africa having this problem, or people in India having this problem. It's really hard to think that there might actually be people who are uh, not housed, who don't have a place to wash their clothes, who, who don't have a, a stable location in these United States. Now, I want you to know that I'm fully aware, I'm fully aware of how people get into these situations, and we want to, we want to be righteous. We want to be say, oh, well, you know, it was because they did this and this and this and this, and I'm saying, you know what? I know that they made those bad decisions. I know, I know, I know. But they still need to eat. Are we going to turn away from our brothers and sisters? Are we? No. Jesus didn't. And if we are his followers, we won't. Okay? So, the temptation, the temptation though, is to, again, short circuit the situation. And just say, no, I'm going to rely upon my tax dollars you know, let social services, let the police take care. I won't name the town, but I, I lived near a town recently. It was close by to the town that I was living in. Unofficially, the response from the police in that town for the homeless was to beat them up. Give them a thorough beating and then tell them to go to the next town and tell the police in the next town that they were beaten by that police force and told never to come back. So because the towns were fairly close together, you could see the homeless living in the one town where across the street was the other town where they didn't go because they knew that they'd get a beating by the police. That's how they kept the homeless out of their town. That's an option. We can just beat them up and send them on to the next town. My friends, Jesus, Jesus said to to the devil at that point. Worship, worship. Are you hearing Revelation 14, verse 7? Worship the God of creation. Worship the Lord your God. Him only shall you serve. Is that not the clarion call of the Seventh-day Adventist church? Isn't that what we believe that we have been called to bring into people's remembrance, to bring into people's minds as a church? that we should be in the service of the Creator God, and that we are here on Sabbath, the seventh day, because we believe in the Creator God who created the world and rested on the seventh day, and that He rested again in the tomb on the seventh day, on the Sabbath, on Passover weekend. He rested in the tomb and began his work again on Sunday. Didn't rest on Sunday. He got up and got back to work on Sunday. He did not short circuit his mission. He went through the pain. He went through the agony. 
And as I've said to this congregation several times, I'm going to say it again. He chose to lay down his life. And he did it in the prescribed way. As the text said today, he told them how he was going to die. And then he voluntarily went ahead and died. He gave up his own life and he promised that he would take it again himself. We serve an all-powerful God who died for us. That's the good news. And so, as you are tempted this week, and you will be tempted, if you bear the name Christian, if you say that you are a follower of the God of the universe, you will be tempted this week to disbelieve him. You will be tempted to make yourself look good in front of other religious people. And then you will also be tempted to, to, to rule the world. Remind yourself of what Jesus did. He only quoted scripture. He didn't trust his own words at that moment when he is in his, his emaciated state, his mind was fixed on his father whose words had gone out in the book of Deuteronomy that said, you will only serve the Lord your God. You will only worship him. Jesus says, and Ellen echoes this, that when you tell the devil to go away in the name of Jesus Christ, in the power in the family name of Jesus Christ, you say, I am going to follow Jesus. I am not going to follow you. I'm not going to disbelieve God. If you do it in his name, the devil has to flee. He cannot be in the presence of a true believer, even the weakest of us. I don't care how, how weak you feel, when you claim the power of Jesus Christ, he will be there in that moment to enliven you and to protect you and to help you to continue trusting your heavenly father, which is what he had to do right through the grave and up again on Sunday. The mountain was conquered. Jesus, the Bible tells us, was ministered to by angels who came and fed him. My friends, there are stories that I have read this week about people who are seeing visions from God in the Muslim world. No ability to be contacted by Christians, but they're seeing visions that are being given to them by angels who are telling them about a God who loves them and his son, Jesus Christ, who came and died for them. And they're looking for people to tell them more. I'm praising God with you today that, that there are some friends of mine who are in that business. They are doing that on your behalf and on my behalf. But who knows? Maybe this week it will be your turn by your actions and by what you are caused to say because he says, I'll give you the words. You might be at work. You might be at school. But you're going to be caused to be that which God will use to help others to trust him again, to trust him more, to believe him when he says, I love you and I want to take you home with me. That's why we call ourselves Adventists. Because we believe in the first advent and because of Jesus coming the first time and dying for us and being raised, that he is at the, the right hand of the Father right now. And he is interceding for us as our high priest. And that he wants nothing more than for the Heavenly Father to say, go get them. Go get them. And that'll be his second coming. That's the one where we're, we're, we're wanting lots and lots of our friends, relatives, neighbors, everybody to know. Jesus is coming again. Are you ready? Do you know him? Do you understand what he wants to do with your life? Do you want to live forever with him? Now, there may be some people who say, yeah, I want to live together, live forever, but I don't want to live with him. <laughs> Sorry, that's not on the option list. Okay? The only way to live forever, the only way to live forever is to accept 
Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Master and to do it now. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't wait until next week. Do it now. Accept Him in your life as your leader. And then decide, I am in this world, but by God's grace, I am not of this world. Amen.